be a visiting professor at the University of Iowa Law School. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned this morning, um, it's a circuitous route. Um, the, uh, the Iowa Federalist Society um, uses this, this space on a monthly basis for their meetings. Um, and uh, Sam Langholz and I have gone back a long, a long way, but I didn't actually know that Sam was the chair or president of the Iowa Federalist or the Des Moines area. I don't know if it's state specific or city specific. Yeah. It's, probably, it's probably more the city. But, but, so but yeah. Sam, and Sam's the guy who is the chair. And so, of course, I, I invited Sam, and Sam said, no, no, what you really want is, uh, who you really want is Derek. So um, I'm looking forward to your presentation. I, I entitled it something really amorphous, so you can do whatever you want. I'm kind of looking at, uh, at Justice Scalia's legacy, um, uh, Justice Gorsuch, and then one of the chapters in your final unit, Unit 6, um, talks about what we call return to fundamental principles which I think is right up um, that alley when you start talking about the Supreme Court and judicial interpretation. So um, I will hand it over to Professor Moore, and, and I think he will invite lots of uh, comments and questions. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll just open with this. So I, I think the, the major theme I want to talk about is originalism. I think that's my goal <laughs> to talk about, because I think it's a word that sometimes gets thrown around a lot. It's a theory of constitutional interpretation, sometimes has shadowy roots or uncertainty, or there's a lot of things about it. So I want to spend some time just thinking about it. We'll talk about different ways that originalism might be used, sort of different theories, pros and cons, uh, competing theories about just what goes into when we read the Constitution, what we ought to be doing. Um, so my research area is primarily election law, but I do a lot of litigation-related courses and a lot of things where we're looking and closely scrutinizing texts, and so that's... That's my goal. So I'm going to open it up to the room right, right off the bat. So we have, this is just going to be like a little anchor kind of exercise to start with to think about the Constitution, right? To look at a text, I don't know, how, how much time have you spent on the Fourth Amendment? Not much? No. Okay, great. Perfect. That's all we need, right? There is a Fourth Amendment. You might be familiar with it, right? This is the, <laughs> this text the, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So simple, straightforward text, right? And there are thousands of disputes every month in the United States about this text, right? I mean, thousands of them. And the Supreme Court hears usually two, three cases a year trying to figure out what's going on with this text. So this is what law is, right? We have something, we have this sort of text, we're spending a lot of time figuring out what it means. And so I'm just going to throw out a couple of ideas, just a couple of thoughts from you. So you look at the text, I'm going to start there, but just start thinking, because you don't have, you don't have this large body of knowledge behind you about what you think these things might mean. But let's say, you know, the police want to go out and they want to search your garbage. Your garbage is at the curb, in front of your house. Do you think they need a warrant? If they don't need a warrant? No, why not? It's outside your house. Okay, is that? He's thrown it away. Not mine anymore. It's not yours? Yeah, I, gave, I just threw it away. I gave up my right to keep the stuff. So can, you get, can you get it back if you want it? Sure, anybody can get it back. That's also a question. So you can get it, right? Anyone from driving down the street might pick it up. Yeah. And so you think cops can get yeah. Yeah. Is it on the curb or is it still next to my house? That's a good, that's a good one too. Okay, we'll put it's it. still next to my house, yeah, I'm just to it. Yeah, but if it's not on the curb, the trash going to come and get up, then we can assume that it's done. So at some point, when it gets far enough away from your house, you sort of abandon it. We think you <laughs> relinquish it. It's no longer, to use a phrase, right? It's no longer your papers or effects or something like that. We think it's it's kind of open to the free world and the cops can do whatever they want then, right? Or do they have to wait till it goes in the garbage truck? That would be another rule, right? You can wait until until somebody else actually removes it or takes it out, as opposed to letting the cops drive. I mean, I don't know. What do you? Well, who owns the garbage can itself? Is it the city owned? Oh. <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> caveat too, right? It changes <laughs> depending on who owns the can. Would you put it in the one can versus another? So I disagree with that. I think it's my sole. For example, if I 
like my cell phone, to actually <coughs> the garbage and went out there to the garbage oh. can. I, I don't think, you know, they, they should be able to, you know, that's still mine. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, what, what, what an interesting part about this discussion, right? Does this have really anything to do with what this says right here, right? Maybe that, this is the first question, right? Do we, are we deriving this from just sort of our own intuitions? Or are we saying, no, there's something about, right, the security in our persons, houses, papers, and effects, that, like, this is something that suggests we need a warrant, or, or that it's, it would be unreasonable for the cops to do this. Right? At some point, we think it becomes reasonable, and at some point, it's not reasonable. Right? So there's a few things happening. One is trying to figure out like, what these things are that are even our stuff. Right? What is our person? Well, we, maybe we know what our person is. We'll talk about that. Houses, papers, and facts. Right? There, there are all these things. If it's not one of those categories, the cops can kind of do whatever they want. Right? If it's just lying in the middle of the park, just kind of pick it up. Right? I mean, that's something that cops could do all the time. They can observe these things. But when it's ours, we're protected in some respect, right? We're protected in a couple of ways. And in fact, this amendment has a couple of provisions, right? Do you always have to get a warrant? So that's that. If you're reading this, do you think cops always have to get a warrant before they get your stuff? No. So why not? They give them permission. Okay, so if you give them permission, maybe. Schools. So it's a probable cause. So ish warrants issue upon probable cause, right? So the cops, theoretically, aren't supposed to go get your stuff unless they have probable cause. And they get probable cause by going to a judge, and the judge says, hey, you've established probable cause. Here's the warrant, particularly describing the place to be searched or the persons or things to be seized. So you think the cops, let's say, let's stipulate right now, the trash beside the curb is not yours, right? It's, oh, it's, not, it's not yours. They don't need a warrant or anything, right? That makes it easy. If it is yours, if it's your stuff, do the cops need to get a warrant to get it? Right? Cops are driving by and they say, it's, they see your trash can sitting there and they say, oh, you know what? I've been looking. I've been looking at Joe for a long time. I think Joe's got heroin ring going around his house. I'd love to get his trash can. But I know, because now, based upon whatever theory we've used, we conclude this is still his effects until the, until the garbage truck comes along. So I need a warrant, but I look up the street and I see the garbage truck coming down the street. And, and, and the cop's sitting there like, so I got about 30 seconds before this evidence is gone. I'm not able to go to the judge. They go to the judge? So it says like, unreasonable searches. So we could say maybe sometimes you have to have, you have to have a warrant in all cases. Or maybe there are times you don't need a warrant that they can search you with probable cause, and it's reasonable. It's reasonable to get in your garbage. The evidence might be destroyed in 30 seconds. Well, they can follow the garbage truck to the garbage to the dump. And figure out what? Which of the bags is <laughs> Which of the bags is this one? I hope it's a bright pink bag that can identify as your garbage. That's, right? not, that's not my problem. Yeah, so you just say cops are kind of tough, out of luck. They ought to get a warrant every time. I know I've seen this on SVU. No, no, I'm just saying, we're working. Sometimes, I, I hate to break, I come from LA, I hate to break it to you. Sometimes Hollywood doesn't have to write all the time. Sometimes I'm a little wrong. Isn't there also plain sight exception, though? Like, if you see it's like a doctor, we're just like bacon and doctor. I'm trying to start from like, just let's read the text, let's think about what it might mean. And so I, don't think, I don't think it's unreasonable to follow that garbage truck necessarily, yeah. or to say, look, now, yeah. this is our procedure. We want you to dump it, not with everything else, but dump it here. Yeah, so, but what about the company that owns the truck? Maybe they don't want you searching their truck without a warrant. Well, they, they, they're they certainly in business with the city. So? That's a whole different question. Can the city yank the contract when the garbage trucks don't don't work with the cops? That might be the trash when you dump it on the street. You look through it. So we have. I mean, there's a few different ways we can think about all these things, right? Do we think you always need a warrant, or sometimes maybe there are reasonable searches where you don't need a warrant? Do we think the garbage is still one of your facts, or do we think it's kind of gone, or is there? Is there an intermediate category that depends on the fact, right? And I, I mean, we can do this. I mean, we can do this all day. We can talk about automobiles, right? 
Are automobiles that I mean, are they your, your paper, your facts? At some point, when you're not in, your cell phone, right? Is it a search of your cell phone if it's unlocked? And just kind of scroll through it. Is it a search of your cell phone if you put your, they take your thumb and drag it over and put your thumbprint on it and then kind of scroll through? I mean, there are a host of things, right? These are all these nuanced factual things. The Supreme Court, yeah, here's two, three cases like this a year. They spend a long time digging on this kind of stuff. Uh, is it a search? I mean, what is a search when the cops dig through your stuff? Is it a search if we bring a dog and kind of sniff around you? The dog starts barking, we think, oh, I guess he's got cocaine on. Or is it a search if we get a little thermoimaging scanner that detects the amount of heat radiating out of your house, and we say, oh, you know, I see a lot of heat in there. I think maybe they're growing marijuana. A lot of this is going to be about a search. I mean, at what point do we call it a seizure? A cop stops you on the street and says, hey, what's going on? It just seized me, right? You stopped me from moving forward. Well, we think, you know, I'm stopping and talking. You can move around them, but would you really move around them? It's a cop. So there with a gun and a badge, and they're staring at you, saying, what's going on? How long do you have to be spending time with them before they start to, they start to say, you've been seized? Your person has been seized by the cops because they've been spending time talking to you? And these are, it's been all day, so a lot of time thinking about it, right? But they maybe the, the question, though, is, where are we getting the notions from about what is a search or a seizure for an effect? What? Okay. So one of the court cases. Our assumptions are the court But there are new cases, right? And where do the judges get these assumptions from? Right? How do the judges decide? How do they look at this text, look at the Fourth Amendment, and say, that's a search, it's not a search. It's reasonable, that's not reasonable. That requires a warrant that doesn't require. There are myriad ways we can go about it. And so sometimes what we might do is we might look at a text like this and say, I mean, what, is, what is the Fourth Amendment really getting at? I mean, I'll open that up. What do you think the Fourth Amendment is really getting at? Like at a high level, what are we worried about? Why did we pass this thing in the first place back in 1780, So we're worried about... Per personal liberty, people, people, well, this actually protects guilty people, right? right? <laughs> That's the question. It tends to protect the guilty more than the innocent, but what is it? We want to protect the liberty of people from being dragged into jail? I mean, or, or guilty people. It's a limit on, on the power of the government. Yeah. But, uh, so why do we, why in particular, why this particular limit on the power of the government? There are lots of ways we can limit the power of the government. Well, King can just arbitrarily throw you in jail for no reason. A king can seize your things, uh, you know, especially going back when you lived in the, uh, on the ground surrounding the castle. Hey, that's, yeah. that's my land. So what is taking your stuff, right? So one way of thinking about this is we care about our personal property. We care about our property rights. And maybe we pass this kind of with the notion of we don't want people taking our stuff. We don't want the government taking our stuff rifling around, seizing our stuff, intruding on our property and looking around, unless they have a really good reason. So what? That's a really good reason, right? Maybe there's like this property background. Well, is, that, is that what you're worried about? They also had, I mean, they quartered soldiers in people's houses, so they had access to all the yeah. facts. That's why the Third Amendment to prohibit that. Yeah. <laughs> and Second Amendment. But this also leads into the Fifth, and it, it, it helps ensure due process. I think that, for me, is an aspect of due process. Okay, so one is that, so another reason is we want to make sure that there's a really good reason, this, like this procedural protection. Before they grab your stuff, we want probable cause, right? We want to make sure that they have a really good reason and it is like this procedural protection. More so than we're worried about them taking our stuff, because maybe we're guilty. We want just a really high procedural state right? I think also it's, a, it's about your person itself. Well, So it's uh, when they violate those, they're violating. Can I put can I put words in your mouth for a moment? Is it is it a privacy concern? Sure. Like that this is this is me and who I am and my stuff, and I really don't like it when the government gets up in my business, right? When they ask me something, they gotta have a really good reason. They gotta come back with a warrant, even if I, even if I.
even if I have no excuse or no good reason at all. They just shouldn't do it. And that's a little bit of a different concern than a property concern, right? The privacy interest of, this is my stuff, this is my domain, you can't get into it. It's a little different than, I own this stuff. You can't look at it, you can't take it, right? These are actually, I mean, I'll raise these as like two of the major competing things that people on the Supreme Court and lawyers think about when they're looking at this amendment. One reason is they say, what is, what is this amendment about? Because it's very hard to read the words in isolation at times. And a lot of times the court says, you know what, the, the nature of the Fourth Amendment is really about invasion of your property. Or the nature of the Fourth Amendment is really about sort of privacy and, and, and the ability to sort of control the stuff you have. So these are, I'd say these are the two dominant views in the Supreme Court right now about how we construe this amendment. And they usually align. They don't always align, right? It doesn't necessarily align in that regard. Um, these are all questions. I mean, as we, as we kind of struggle through what this means, what it doesn't mean, what the contours of it are, it's just this question about what the text of the Constitution means. And this is basic constitutional law. This is basic law generally, right? Asking what texts mean. And so how, how do we go about doing it? I mean, for a lot of you, you, you well, it's either comes from television, right, or <laughs> some background about plain sight acceptance. There's something back in the back of our mind. We've heard some doctrines. But what do we do when we have a tax or we come up with something for the first time? How do we go about interpreting the Constitution? And so when we talk about originalism, it's just one of the ways that we can use sort of tools to determine what the Constitution is. And there are lots of different ways that people go about saying, what does this text mean? How do I figure out what it is? Because one of the problems, I say the problem of the Constitution, right? The problem of the Constitution is it's very short. Designed to be that way. So if you've read, I mean, do, do, do you spend much time on the Articles of Confederation at all, or a little bit of it? I mean, you go back and read Articles of Confederation, it's actually pretty long. It's pretty substantial in terms of the details that go through the Articles of Confederation. And the, the original Constitution, the Bill of Rights, extends a little bit. The original Constitution is actually shorter. And there's not a whole lot there, right? designedly so. When you read the constitutions of contemporary nations, the EU, I think, I mean, it's a disaster, right? It's just, it's dozens and dozens of pages, and you're spending all your time sort of parsing through it because it's designed to be this kind of comprehensive document of every kind of nuanced detail. The Constitution is designedly simple. So that causes different kinds of problems, right? How do we take this simple text that can apply in all these circumstances and construe it, particularly given, I mean, some of these words, I mean, maybe we, uh, I don't know, what's the most concrete word in here? Houses, papers? Maybe those are the most concrete things. But you read some things like unreasonable, and that can be really tough to spend some time thinking about it. And even when I say a word like effects, even that, you have to start thinking, what does exactly that word mean? So whenever we run into this or any kind of provision of the Constitution, we're just asking, what is the proper way of approaching or interpreting this text? What's the proper way of interpreting the Constitution? Um, do we have to be consistent every time we do it? Uh, and who gets to say? I mean, one of, the, one of the problems with the Constitution is there are, there are only two places in the Constitution where it says that the text shall be construed in a particular way the 9th and 11th Amendments. They don't pop up much. Everything else, <laughs> left the judges, left the people to figure out how to construe this text, how to interpret it. Um, so for my, my, my we'll give you the, the definition, right? The definition of originalism is just at its core, and there's going to be a lot of different flavors we'll talk about, I'm interested in hearing sort of feedbacks or thoughts on it, is that the meaning of the Constitution is fixed at the time of its enactment. And our job as lawyers or judges or people in the public, or in the, in the polis, right, are to use tools to discern its meaning as fixed at the time it was established. Right? So the Constitution is fixed in 1789, the Bill of Rights in 1793, the 14th Amendment in 16, or 1868. Right? And so those texts have a meaning. These words have a meaning at that time. 
and our job is to figure out what they are. So we do a lot that we would look at the words, not just the words themselves, we can look at the grammar, we can look at the structure, we can look at not just this text, if there's a word like persons or unreasonable, we can look throughout the Constitution and say, is that word used in other places, and how do we construe it in those other places? Um, and then maybe sometimes we have to move outside the text and say, what were the people talking about when this was submitted to the state legislatures for ratification? Uh, what did the people of the state legislatures talk about? When it was debated in the newspaper, like the Federalist Papers, what were they, what did they think this text meant? When we were seeing the anti-Federalists worried about what it might mean, what did they think? And these are all tools to discern the meaning of the text. Not everybody agrees on what tools to use. Nobody, not everybody agrees on uh, what each of these words might mean, but that is sort of at its core what originalism is about. So there are a few different things. Um, I'll describe a few different kind of theories of originalism to start, and then I, I, I'll, I'll stop at points in time for feedback, because I, I understand you'll probably have some questions and <laughs> challenges. Um, so what is, I mean, there's kind of a version of originalism that's almost just textualism, right? You just read the text, kind of stick there. That doesn't get you very far, right? Um, particularly because some of these words are not the kinds of words that we might immediately understand. So one of my favorite examples to use is, uh, you know, in the text of the Constitution, there is the phrase domestic violence, right? If you're reading that today, you would think of something very different than what they meant in 1789, right? Where uh, it, it, it guaranteed Congress or the United States shall guarantee to protect the states in the event of domestic violence, the event of civil war, right? So there are ways in which we can look at those texts, and we obviously need some context. We need to understand a little bit more about what's what's happening. So then there was in the in the 80s, and this was Attorney General Ed Meese, this was also popular with uh, Judge Robert Bork, uh, came this phrase about the doctrine of original intent, right? And that is, we look at what the people who wrote these words intended. So we can look at that a lot of ways. We can look at the uh, ratifying conventions. We can see what uh, Madison and Adams and uh, occasionally Washington and others had to say about it. And once we see what they thought these words meant, um, that's really helpful to figuring out what these words actually mean. Um, and some people have challenged that. So, you know, that's, that might be a good thing sometimes, but you know there were dozens of men who signed off on this document. Did they all really mean the same thing? Uh, how do you figure out the intent of a lot of different people all thinking about something? Or that it was submitted to thousands of people who ratified it. How do we figure out if they understood the text in the same way? And so you can go back and look and say, well, what did you know, Madison, what did... Uh, Washington, what did Adams think about the word effects there? What did they think was reasonable or unreasonable? And that might be helpful, um, but there could be limitations with that. So then there came uh, a more popular and more widely adopted version of original public meaning. So rather than just original intent, where we're just looking at the framers, instead we look at the meaning of the words as understood in the public eye at the time the texts are ratified. And so Justice Scalia was much more uh, an advocate of this theory of originalism. And to say, look, when these texts are sent out, they have to be ratified by the people, right? The ratified by the state legislatures. There's a public, ongoing debate about them. So who cares? Well, maybe not who cares, but what Madison thinks or what Adams thinks only gets you so far. Because all the people thought that they're all getting together and they are engaged in this public debate and those words have meaning at the time, and we can look maybe at dictionaries, we can look at newspaper usage, we can look at Blackstone's commentaries or other legal common law texts from England that we have in the United States. We can look at all these sources, and at the end of the day, it will help us say, okay, this is what these words meant, these are what the concepts meant when the people ratified it. So we look at the original public meaning, look at what an ordinary person might think of. But it still is a legal text. And what everybody thinks uh, is helpful, but you know, it, it still might only get us so far. So another popular and most recently popular philosophy of originalism has been original methods originalism. Right? That is, 
Maybe we look at intent, or maybe we look at public meaning, or something like that, but we look at what the people who drafted this would have done to look at what it meant. Right? So when these, if these texts are drafted, and they say, well, when we're drafting this, we think we're looking at what the people are saying about it, we would go toward more of the public methods, or, or public meaning. If we're drafting kind of in a closed room, <laughs> In Philadelphia, 1787, maybe we look more at the intent of the people who were sort of drawing up the texts. And in that way, the methods are tied to what the people who were drawing it up might have done. That's a good way, like, I, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to an analogy about contrast. But when we think about contrast, it's kind of what we do, right? We look at the people who drew it up, and we ask them, like, how would you have looked at this? And that's kind of the touchstone for when it comes to original methods, original. Um, and then finally, there's a new kind of philosophy of originalism that uh, sort of those who are more liberal or more progressive have tended to adopt. And it's sometimes called the new originalism or constructionist originalism. Uh, right, I'm sure you love all these terms, but I think there's one flavor of originalism and it's all over the map. Right? But it is a notion of, we look at some texts and some texts are very plain, like the president has to be 35 years old. We stick with that. We ought to sort of adhere to those texts, and at some point, kind of the meaning runs out a little bit. I'm not sure what unreasonable might mean. I'm not sure what probable cause might mean. I spend some time looking at the framers, and they only give me so far. Um, and so at that point, maybe I have other values that kind of trump. I start thinking about uh, you know, whether we have a commitment to democracy or a commitment to process or whatever it might be. And at that point, I sort of construe some of these more uncertain texts through a different lens. And so that provides you a little bit more flexibility, uh, a little bit more ability to, uh, to achieve the desired ends that you might think are best that the Constitution is designed to achieve um, without feeling constrained by what people at a particular time have thought about. Um, let me pause there for a moment. Any, any thoughts or immediately concerns or reactions to different ways of thinking about what originalism is or can go about doing? Yeah. So, constructionist or constructivist would be more of looking at what is the principle that it's trying to protect. Or yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, absolutely. Go back to dog sniffs, go back to cell phones. Okay. <laughs> so that's all the, the things that originalism is doing um, or designed to do. So, you know, there are also questions that lawyers have, and lawyers typically have these questions. When we get to a text like unreasonable, if you think like unreasonable, there are lots of phrases like due process, equal protection, right? These are not the easiest terms to understand, um, particularly even if you spend some time looking in texts. And so it's hard, it's hard work to do good originalism, right? It means, especially because most of the Constitution is very old, and even the newer stuff is from the Civil War, <laughs> you have to spend a long time digging into what people thought at the time, the common phrases and words that were used, other legal texts around, and determine meaning. And the thought is that there is a meaning to all these things. It might take a lot of work, it might take a lot of effort, and some of it, over time, we might understand a little bit more. But the goal is to have kind of this neutral playing field where all of us can kind of agree. Our goal is to get at this original meaning of the Constitution. In whatever form we use, we try to use the best tools that are available at our disposal, and that will give us kind of the law, the fixed law that we have in the Constitution. Um, so there are a lot of different reasons why you say, Okay, why would somebody want to use this methodology, right? Why would you spend all this time <laughs> digging through history books, digging through ancient texts? Um, what is it about originalism that's good? So I'll offer some of the reasons. And again, originalists differ as to why they might support it or not, and then I'll offer some critiques of them, and I'll also add in a little bit later the reasons why people might prefer a different methodology. Um, so I would say that for most originalists, I think they tend to break down into kind of two camps. Uh, and within those camps, a lot of different ways of thinking about it. One is more the process-based, or, or what lawyers call the positivist-based camp. And positivism is the sphere of 
If that's what the law is, that's what the law is. You stick to it. Right? Like, that's what's good. <laughs> what's good is sticking to the written text. And we don't care as a judge, we don't care as the people if we like the rule or not. We just say it's about the text. And the process is we just want to make sure we're going through the results and checking off the boxes and we're trying to figure out meaning. Don't really care if it ends us up with a good or bad result. It is what it is. So that's like one philosophy that's saying this is what is demanded of us as lawyers in society. The other side uh, are those who look at the results, or what they might call the normative constitution, and say, we think originalism is the best way to achieve a great society. Or it's the best way to achieve kind of the democratic ideal that we want in the United States. So we use originalism not because we have to, not because it's sort of the setup of rules. It's because we think it is the thing that leads to the best results and will lead to the most sort of prosperity, the most liberty, whatever it might be that you sort of view as the valuable thing you have. So those are a couple of different reasons. So they, they fall into different camps, right? One is to say, well, the framers did this. Right? They would say, the framers were originalists, therefore we should be originalists. Because they were the ones who wrote the text of the Constitution. In the debates, they said, well, we look at what was, what was happening at the time. This is what we intend. This is what we mean. The Federalist Papers are all about what we mean the text to be. And they spent a long time explaining this seemingly self-executing simple text. And they're explaining it, and later on, as the courts start looking at it, courts start saying, oh, you know what, this is what, this is what the framers thought, this is what the people in the first Congress thought, that's really valuable. Um, so if the framers did it, we ought to do it too. Right? Um, I'm glad something maybe a little circular, because if the framers did it, why were the framers doing it, right? Uh, did they have a good reason for doing it? Why should that bind us? Maybe it's a good reason that they did it. I think it's persuasive, but it might not get us all the way there and say, this is a good way of interpreting the Constitution. Um, another is to say, well, this is what law is. That's a very big idea, right? But say, when we pass a law, the law is a tax. It means something, and when we pass a law, it has to have some meaning, and this is the way we determine meaning. Right? We determine meaning by looking at the meaning that was used at the time the law was drafted. Uh, but that's a little bit limited, too, because it, it assumes <laughs> that's what you do. There are other ways you can determine the meaning of laws rather than just looking at the intent. Um, so another would say, well, this is what written constitutions do. Think about when, when you enter into an agreement. You might have an oral agreement with somebody, right? But if you put it down in writing, all of a sudden you pause. You might slow down. You might say, well, what are, when I put the words on paper, I'm thinking a lot more carefully now. If I have to sign off on something, I'm thinking a little bit more about what these words mean because I'm worried that I'm not binding myself to something. Right? We do that with contracts all the time. Right? I mean, I know nowadays you just check the box and you bind yourself to whatever Apple's terms and conditions are in service. Right? Or we sign a mortgage without reading every page on it, right? as we learned in the last decade. But the thought was <laughs> when you sign these texts, Writing it down is a big deal. And so the, the words, the writtenness of the words is what really matters in this case. And because they are words, language has meaning. I don't think language is meaningless, right? So we've got to spend some time figuring out what it means. And we think the best way to do this is looking at what it meant when you sat down and wrote it. You spend your time thinking about when, when the people got together to write this stuff, what happened? What did it mean at that time? Um, so another way is to say, well, originalism kind of best fits with democracy. That is, when people got together, they codified these words, the people ratified this text, and as a democracy, that's a great thing. But it means we kind of have to stick to it now. This is what the democratic ideal is, to stick to this text. And originalism gives us kind of those tools to say, at this time, the text means this. It's a democracy. We got together and codified this, and that's the thing that we most value. Um, now, sometimes, though, of course, in democracy, it means that we're going to strike down laws, or we might not strike down acts of an executive, even if we kind of all agree on it. So it recognizes we have to start thinking about what democracy is, what it means, what ought to be. That's a challenge, too, right? Because I think we might all have, you know, a lot of us probably might have different ways about thinking about what democracy is and how it fits together, whether or not you have to be an originalist to agree with democracy. Um, 
One is, well, as a process-based concern, it constrains judges. Right? If the legislature does something, the executive does something, and the judiciary doesn't like it, it can't just kind of look around the Constitution and make up a reason for striking it down. Right? And, and I, this was a very popular reason in the 80s to adopt originalism, to say judges are out of control. Originalism is a way of controlling judges. And so it constrains judges because they're no longer doing things based on what they want or what they feel. They're stuck to a text. Right? Um, it is true, but uh, it's not always going to get you the uh, results you desire. Right? It assumes, first off, we need to constrain judges, which maybe some people didn't think so. I think uh, Earl Warren didn't think he needed to be constrained. <laughs> Uh, and second, it assumes that you know, there are still going to be times when the judiciary is going to step in and strike down laws, and that those are okay cases to strike down laws, where there are other cases that aren't. So what is it about originalism that helps us get there to say, this is the right kind of way of constraining judges? Because they're the far, far extreme, which is just no judicial review. <laughs> so they let the legislature and executive do, they read the text too, let them be bound by it. Judges don't have to come in and interpret it. Judges don't strike down what they like. Others would say, the originalism leads to really good results and say, I am a, uh, I believe that the Constitution is an embodiment of individual liberty. And when I look at originalism, originalism helps us get to that vision of liberty. Or, I, I have a strong view of natural rights. I, I love the, the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, or the, the, the opening of the Declaration of Independence, I believe there are these natural rights that we have as people, and I think when I construe the Constitution in this way, in an originalist way, it helps us achieve these rights. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, all these kinds of things. Um, so a challenge is we don't all agree with all these things, right? I mean, not all of us might be kind of libertarians, not all of us might agree we have natural rights. Not, not everyone might agree on these things. And so if we adopt the Constitution and say originalism helps get us to X, we're in a pluralistic society. Not everybody agrees on X. Some of us think the Constitution ought to be doing Y, or are we doing Z? Um, so it can be a challenge thinking about that, that, uh, that, plur that pluralism we have. Um, another is to say, this is what popular sovereignty demands. The people, we the people, so we get right at the beginning, right? Wait, that's the name of this curriculum, right? I didn't, I didn't intend to do that. We the people <laughs> are the ones who ratified it. And we the people meant something by this text when we the people ratified it. And originalism is the best way to ensure popular sovereignty, which is, we are the ones who enacted this text, you have to stick to it. Because if you don't, you're denying that popular sovereignty. Or there's another that goes a little bit farther and says, the good thing about the Constitution is it requires a lot, a lot of consensus to do anything, right? The Constitution required nine states to ratify, so it required some broad consensus. And then when you get a constitutional amendment to change that original constitution, you've got to get two-thirds of both houses of Congress plus three-quarters of the states. That is this extraordinary supermajoritarian commitment. And so when we can all get together, it takes a lot of effort for us all to get together and agree on something, we got to stick to it. Because that's what we agreed to. And that's what we can all agree to on this supermajoritarian basis. And that is a good way of running society. That if we intend something by the text here, and we can all agree, and it takes a lot of effort before we're going to change that, right? we have to reach a high degree of consensus, then that is a good thing. And that's a value that we want to pursue as well. So again, these are all, they're different. People come to originalism from different perspectives. They, they want the process, or they think it leads to the best results. They, they feel a commitment to the people who ratified it, or to democracy, or to what law is, uh, or, or they're particularly concerned about achieving liberty, or whatever it might be. So originalists can come to this from different reasons and think there are different good reasons for achieving, uh, for, for, for using these tools to discern the text. All right. I pause there. Any, any reflections on that? Concerns? Thoughts? Lack of persuasion, persuaded by something, something you've heard before. Why is that binding on, why is what they wrote binding on me? So that's Jefferson, right? <laughs> so Jefferson would have said, like, every 20 years, you just come up with a new constitution, right? And that's, that's what it is. So uh, 
The Madisonian vision was more like when you establish a constitution, this is sort of establishing this text for the people. And the reason the people want to come is it, to them and their generation, to ourselves and our posterity, as we say, right? And so to the extent that that text is there and, and codifies that meaning, if we want to change it, we're welcome to. It just requires a lot of consensus for all to get together and change it. So Jefferson would have said, we just blow it up every 20 years, and we all get back into a room and do this all over again. Whereas for Madison, it was, this is for ourselves and our posterity, and this is the text that will bind us, and if we want to change it, it just requires us to do it affirmatively. Right? I mean, isn't, that, isn't that what we do when uh, new courts interpret it in a different way? Isn't that, in essence, what we're doing? That the judges are... They're, they're put it there by now, much more in a partisan way. But if, believe me, if the nation didn't agree with that, the nation wouldn't stand for it. Yeah. It would change. So isn't that, if we're going to abide by that 200 years later, we ought to be okay on any, any little, and, and the interpretations aren't radical interpretations. Yeah, so I think, so a couple things on that. I think, I think you've hit on some points. Um, well, I should say, we've had, we've had partisanship for about 200 years. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's too new. Right? We tried to impeach a justice in 1803 because uh, the anti-federalists didn't like him. It's <laughs> been around for a long time. We have changed the text when we don't like what the judges do. We've only done it twice. Um, not a very popular thing. Once was when it was found out that you, as a citizen, could sue somebody, could sue another state. So we amended the text of the Constitution of the 11th Amendment. Very bizarre for the people of the United States to get that upset about it, you would think today, right? That you could sue a state and we would amend the Constitution to revoke that right. Um, the second is the, uh, there was a construction from the court that you, uh, we couldn't do individual, or we couldn't do income taxes. That would be a direct tax, or it would be a direct tax. And so we amended the Constitution to authorize income taxes. Which again, very bizarre kind of thing, which we think that people would be so excited about permitting an income tax. Most of the time, we haven't responded with a constitutional amendment to what the Supreme Court has done. Now, part of that is, it's really hard to do, right? So you have this sort of, you have two, two positions. And let's say the people of the United States are divided 50-50 on an issue. So you have kind of the pre-existing condition, and then you have the Supreme Court maybe interpreting the law in a way that uh, is inconsistent with the original meaning of the Constitution. Well, you only got 50% of the people on your side, so it's very hard to come back and change that. I think the Supreme Court has, for the most part, been very careful uh, when it is in a not originalist mode of not acting in a way that the people generally view it as undermining the integrity of the court or undermining the meaning of the Constitution. That most people would look around and say, well, I think that's kind of okay. I think that construction the Constitution is okay. So that's, that's one aspect. Um, Another is, it requires sort of super consensus to get together and amend the Constitution. But even when there's super consensus, people, especially today, get really nervous about amending the Constitution. Um, so, you know, 30 years ago, the Supreme Court concluded that flag burning is a protected First Amendment value. And you poll people, right? And you're, one of the easiest things to get consensus on, right? 90% of the people would say, absolutely, I think flag burning is an atrocious thing that ought to be criminalized. And yet, it comes to like passing a constitutional amendment as an attempt to pass a constitutional amendment. And then people start getting cold feet and they say, oh, amend the Constitution? I might disagree. I might think it's a terrible thing, but amending the Constitution is, this, is a big deal. So, and maybe this is just how we the people are now, right? We view amendment as this extraordinary stuff. We've only amended it once in the last 40 years, and even that it was ratifying one of the original Bill of Rights uh, about pay raises for members of Congress. We've moved away from this notion that we think we ought to be in the process of amending, um, and so kind of hands off and just like hope the courts for themselves. Oh, that really helps answer the, <laughs> address it, but it addresses, I think, some of the things that we've been facing. Yeah? How does it and work with changing in technology. So internet yeah. and searches of press and hearing right. and all those kind of things that have never been thought of. Great. Any, are there any linguists in the room? Okay, if not, that's good. Oh, wait, are you? I'm an English teacher. Uh, well, okay. 
<laughs> hopefully, hopefully I won't butcher things too badly. I was an English major, but okay. But I want to talk about something, and, and this is something the originals talk about. They, they use a phrase called the sense reference distinction. Okay, this sense, all right. That is, words have multiple meanings. And you can look at a word, and let's take something very simple like car, right? So if you were to say the word car in the word in 1900, right? The word car in 1900 clearly means something different than it does today in one sense, right? In the sense that, like, you look around and like, yeah, I guess that's got four wheels and a motor and a steering wheel, but it's nothing like this thing we have today, right? So the word car has a sense about it. That is, there's a meaning to the word that clearly is fixed on something, some essence of what cars are. But at the same time, it's also referring to something at a historical point in time. And if we look at it today, when we use the word car, we're referring to something very different. But we have the same sense of the word car between 1900 and today, don't we? That is, it has some essence to it that even though we might be referring to something very particular, the sense is always going to last with us. And so words have this distinction. We can look at something like effects, right? Effects clearly does not anticipate automobiles, iPhones, and whatnot. But I think there's no question that you, if you read a text of something like effects, when you read it in context of persons, houses, and papers, the sense of, it might refer at that time to things like, I, mean, I don't know if your horse or your saddle or, or what, or your outhouse would be the kinds of things that would fall into that. And it refers to those things, but the sense is that it comes along with the stuff, particularly the things to be seized. It comes with a sort of suite of definitions about things that go along with that that would apply today. And so there is a change in tech. There's no question that technology changes things. <laughs> or some phrases are actually, they talk about things like cruel and unusual. I think a lot of people would agree cruel and unusual may well change. In the sense that it refers at a time to this practice is cruel and unusual. But today we might look back and say, you know, I know you thought that was okay, but today it does mean something different. The sense is cruel and unusual. We can spend some time thinking about what those words mean in terms of the sense, the essence of them. But the fact that they refer to something particular doesn't mean that we can't apply it to new, changing, updated circumstances. So that requires a lot of work, right? That, that's also a whole lot of work. One is to say, I'm not just saying, oh, it's cruel and unusual to me, or I think it's cruel and unusual, right? But the kinds of practices that, you know, at the founder would be deemed kind of barbaric, like that they talk about these kinds of things, like drawing and quartering people as the kinds of things that would have been embodied with. So you get to today, and then people would talk about, what do you talk about with cruel and unusual punishment? Is the death penalty cruel and unusual punishment? And so some people would look and say, well, I mean, I, mean, I guess if you look where you're supposed to look in terms of the, the sense of cruel and unusual. You look around the world, and a lot of countries don't use the death penalty. A lot of countries that we want to emulate don't use it, but there are places like uh, Japan that do. Uh, or you say, I look at the rest of the Constitution, and actually we can find capital offenses, we can find the death penalty mentioned in the text of the Constitution in multiple other places. So it's very hard for us to say the death penalty is cruel and unusual, even if we might think it is today. Uh, or you might look and say, well, I think the, the sense of that word, the way that it was used at the time, that maybe drawing quartering people was something that some places did, but that there was this it was really about the consensus as opposed to sort of the practice, the barbarism itself. And so that's the debate that plays out, right? I think uh, that's a challenge. It's a different kind of analysis than sitting down and saying, I think this is cruel and unusual. This is what some judges have done before and say, I view this as a cruel and unusual thing, therefore it's unconstitutional, as opposed to trying to discern what this phrase might have meant, the essence of it, and drawing that sense into What else? The reactions, yeah. yeah this may, I guess be a dumb question, but uh -huh. um, I mean, do you, do you think that the founding fathers thought that it would be interpreted in an originalistic way? Because I mean, 
mean, they, they obviously provide the ability to, to change it. Yes. And so, do you think that their thinking was that it, it would be interpreted, especially for as many years as it has been? <laughs> or, or, yeah. or would they would they argue that, that they did not intend, and they intended it to be a living document because they provided that, that loophole, essentially, to change it? Yeah, so I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things. I mean, I think there's... First off, there's a lot of things they did not anticipate we would do or have. <laughs> I mean, they would not, at the time, they thought things like, how, how in the world will a nation of three million people ever be governed by a single document? Right? How can we ever have a district with, uh, where you are represent, where 50,000 people are represented by a representative? Right? And today, we have not only 300 million people, but our representatives represent 500,000 of them. <laughs> I mean, you know, most states are larger than the original so why is it? Well, they didn't anticipate a lot of stuff. They hoped it was going to work. Uh, it was going to last a long time. Um, I, I think there's strong support, and, and again, but this is the original defense, right? I think there's strong support that they believe, like, when they were putting these words down, they meant something by them at that time, and that they were going to be bound by them and by those words for an extended period of time. Um, so one of the great, I think one of the great examples to think about is somebody like James Madison, um, because he does talk about how, uh, you know, so he's writing these words as a, 21-year-old kid, right? He, he has all these visions about how the Constitution is supposed to operate. And early on, he's saying, you know, the Bank of the United States is an unconstitutional exercise of Congress's power. I don't think you can do this. And then he becomes president. He kind of looks back and says, well, I mean, maybe I thought that. <laughs> um, but clearly, there's a meaning and a term and a definition and a process that has led to this kind of what he calls liquidation in Federalist 37. Over time, we can understand some of the ambiguities of the text. And maybe I thought it means one thing, maybe other people think it means something else, and over time a consensus develops about what that text actually means. So there's a little bit of him on the side of, well, maybe sometimes there's a little bit of development. Maybe there's a, a development understanding, because by the time he becomes president, he all of a sudden thinks, thank you, actually, it's okay. <laughs> and it's constitutional. And the court agrees with him, so that works. But, so there is a sense in which, over time, maybe certain words, when they're, they're really uncertain through the practices and patterns and habits, kind of fix their meaning. A lot of people will point to things like George Washington. What George Washington did is hugely influential today. I mean, we don't even think about it. I mean, we, we amended the Constitution to ratify the two-term term limit of presidents because of George Washington, and because FDR chose not to adhere to that. We, we think about things about uh, him going to the, the uh, Supreme Court for advice, the Supreme Court turning him down and saying, we don't give advisory opinions. It's like a momentous moment about his exercise of, of authority with ratifying treaties internationally. There, there are all these things that he does just over time we sort of adopted his practices. So that's not really even saying that he intended to do that, right? Those practices are the kinds of things that we adhere to. Um, but finally, and probably more so Adams and somebody like Jefferson, they would say, well, we mean something by these words, and we hope that these words will bind us and our heirs. Yeah, our problem amended. And I think at the time, they thought amendment was going to be, it was hard. But, I mean, they amended it, uh, you know, 12 times by 1804. It's pretty quick, and that's a lot. And I think they thought there was going to be more of that kind of thing. So people ask today, well, what is it about the amendment? Why don't we amend the Constitution anymore? So part of it is the psyche of the American people. Part of it is, I think, we just kind of expect now that judges are going to do it for us. Right? That is, if we don't like something about the Constitution, we just convince judges that to ignore it, to construe it in a different way. And the people aren't motivated to amend the Constitution anymore. There's just not an appetite for it. And maybe it is that we are just, as a, such a large society, it's very hard for us to reach on that supermajoritarian consensus. Yeah? Um, I don't know if you want to share this or not, but oh. just so we could provide to our students yeah. another view. Sure. What do you think is the best argument against Virginia? Oh well, how about I how about I offer the competing claims, <laughs> and we'll see we'll, we'll see if that helps. So I mean, I think I offered in each of these justifications, I offered some reasons why people might think that they're not like sufficiently justified. Um, so if you so people would say let's do let's use um, different methods, right? And so people um, have different ways of. It. Because you're saying, how can anybody like, isn't this what judges do? Well, they spend a lot of time 
digging into the Federalist Papers, talking about what the ratif ratification debates had to say. And they do that a lot more. And I think it's a testament to the influence of people like General Neese and Justice Scalia and others who have really changed the debate that even uh, many liberals and progressives would use original methods, original tools to defend their claims often, not always. Um, so all alternative ways would be just judges' personal policy preferences. And there's a school of legal thought that says that's what judges do anyway. It's called realism. Realistically, you're a judge. You're just going to achieve the result you think is just or right or fair anyway. Now, a lot of people don't like to say that's a good thing. <laughs> they don't like to say that's the way to go. Um, but it's another way of interpreting these texts. These texts are sort of very abstract guiding principles just to what you think is right. But of course, there are challenges about depends on the judge. <laughs> depends on what the judge's personal policy preferences are. Um, another is to look at consensus, right, and say, Constitution's really hard to get to. We can look at evolving standards. We can look at the consensus of the people. And you know, at one point, segregation's okay. At some point, it's not. At one point, bans on interracial marriage are okay. At one point, later on, they're not. At one point, bans on abortion are okay. At one point, later on, they're not. And just as we see as a society what kind of society thinks, judges try to do a pretty good job of gauging what the public consensus is and stepping into the breach and making sure that we can construe the text in a way that sort of reflects those sort of consensus values. Um, another is that judges are particularly concerned about the protection of minority rights, right? And not just racial minorities, but sort of any political minority. That is, if I'm, if, if I'm, uh, you know, unmarried person who wants access to contraception, right? or I'm a gay who, person who wants to get married, or whatever it might be, I'm in a clear minority in the community, and it's the judge's job to step in and help in those situations. Because if the majority wants their way, they can get it. They can vote, they can elect people, they can change things. For minority groups, if there's a real problem, particularly if it's something about you that can't change, like your skin color, that's something we really want judges to be involved in. And so protection of minority rights would be one way. Um, and so part of it is that there are these fundamental values and saying, we have these values as a society, and judges need to help advance those values. Um, so particular values, I think, in recent years have really revolved around privacy. And the Constitution doesn't have a lot to say in its express text about privacy. And yet, in the last 50 years, I would say this, the courts have been very active in ensuring that people are able to sort of live their lives in a liberty way, in a way that ensure they're sort of able to maintain their privacy. I'd say, why should we be bound by this text, which is, first off, very old, <laughs> second off, often uncertain, words like unreasonable, and third, that was written by some people who maybe didn't have all the right ideas. They owned slaves. They did not let women vote. Uh, th there were lots of things that were not pleasant about those areas. Why should we bind ourselves to them? Right? And the responses, I think, primarily are, well, first off, the founders were actually remarkably good given their situation. <laughs> In the sense of nobody had ever tried democracy like this. Nobody ever. You go to a Greek city-state, or you go to a few cantons in Switzerland, that's your democracy. Like, this was a remarkable achievement. The fact that they didn't get everything done, that some of them freed their slaves, but not all, that some of them thought more highly of women than others, uh, you know, we, we accept that maybe not everyone is the most virtuous, but you don't you shoot the messenger. You look at the text, you try to stick to it, you adhere to it. So I think those are some of the challenges that people would say. And particularly, I think many people are very, I think, results-based. And they say, if this doesn't achieve good results, why would we adhere to this system? Right? And that's why I think some of the more, what I say, again, the normative defenses of originalism to say, oh, this helps us maximize individual liberty, or this helps us flourish as a human society in some respect. If those are, it helps us maximize our natural rights. Or again, if you're a progressive, these are the kinds of, it helps us maximize our liberty in terms of personal autonomy and privacy. 
there are different reasons why you might say this is the method we use because it helps us best achieve the ends and the results that we want. Does that help or you have other like yeah? Else. Um, so a few other things. Uh, oh, you have, no, okay. um, one is we can also think about uh, stare decisis, right? Great Latin phrase that means the, the the thing having been decided should stand. And what happens is we think it's really bad for courts to come in and just revisit issues all the time. So stare decisis is this principle of law, long-standing principle of law, that like cases ought to be decided alike, and that courts should not overturn a previous decision unless they have a really, really good reason to do so. Um, and there's a whole lot of competing theories about the, what this looks like. And I think this actually, so on the court, I would say there are two, uh, you know, or have been two, like true originalists in, in, in one regard. Uh, that is Justices Scalia and Thomas. And they have very different views about stare decisis. So Justice Scalia would say, look, sometimes 20 years, 50 years, 100 years pass, and you kind of got to get over it and say, maybe I think the text originally meant something else, but I just got to move beyond it. So this came out in, a, in a, uh, the uh, McDonald, the Illinois gun case, where the court applies the Second Amendment against the states and says the states have to be bound by the Second Amendment, just like they're bound by the First Amendment, by the Fourth Amendment, by lots of other amendments. And this happens through the Fourteenth Amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment says, shall not deprive of any person without due process of law. Um, and so that's not actually a great phrase to incorporate the amendments. And people have a long, long laundry list of reasons about why that's not a good phrase. Because the point is, if they pass a law, that's process. And if they pass a law prohibiting you from owning a gun, that's your process. Go to the legislature from the executive. But that's the way that the courts have looked at the Constitution and said, when we apply the Bill of Rights against the states, when the, the states are bound by the Bill of Rights, we go through the due process clause. So Justice Scalia says, look, this is what we've always done. And we're going to kind of keep doing this. And Justice Thomas says, you know, 150 years ago, there, was a, there were the slaughterhouse cases, which construed the privileges or immunities clause in such a narrow, cramped way that we've ignored it for 150 years. He says, I would go back and revisit all those. Because I think the original Privileges or Immunities Clause in the 14th Amendment uh, protects the privileges and immunities of citizenship, which includes protections like the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom of assembly, and the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, and the right to bear arms. And so I would go back to that original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, and that's where you get your Second Amendment rights so, originalism doesn't say much about stare decisis, right? Different justices have different philosophies about how strongly do you stick to an old decision of the court. So I don't know what Justice Gorsuch's view is going to be. Um, but there are different ways about thinking about stare decisis. Different than originalism, right? Originalism is just asking us what the correct meaning is. Stare decisis is saying, when we got the right meaning, what should we do with it? Do we just kind of say, we're stuck with it, the people need to amend the Constitution, it's water under the bridge. What do you say? You're going to rip the bandage off that's 150 years old if we think we got it wrong that long ago and revisit major areas of subtle doctrine. Um, for originalists, this is a great challenge. Neither is a great option. <laughs> on the one hand, you say you're going to stick to something that you think is wrong. On the other hand, you're ripping off something that might be 100 or 200 years old in terms of judicial precedent. That's a problem. It's very decisive. Um, uh, let's see, one more thing to, to talk about open up for some more questions. Or, you know, people talk about, I, I, think, I think people tend to fixate on the results of originalism as maybe one of the biggest problems with it. They tend to disagree, right? And they say, look, if we adhere to your view, doesn't that mean the Constitution says nothing about abortion? The Constitution says nothing about same-sex marriage. The Constitution would permit segregation in schools. Isn't that what originalism is really about? So the originalists have some dilemmas, right? Sometimes they uh, use originalist methods to defend some of these cases that were not really originalist in their grounds, and others would say, yeah, that's the Constitution. You can either amend it or uh, kind of stick by it. 
So I'll mention something like Brown versus Board of Education, right? I mean, seminal landmark case. And many people, when they challenge originalism, say, but Congress, when it passes the 14th Amendment, the same Congress segregated the DC schools. So how in the world can you say that originalism is good if Brown versus the Board of Education might be overturned? And there are lots of, there's a lot of originalist thought on Brown versus the Board. Um, if you read Brown versus the Board, I encourage you to, because I think it's, a, it's an illuminating case from a matter of constitutional theory and doctrine. Because a lot of it is about sort of the, the social science of how school children felt playing with black and white dolls and things like that. It's not a lot of talking about the text of the Constitution. Whereas the originalists would look and they'd say, you know, actually we can look at the debates in Congress in the 1870s, and maybe they were segregating schools themselves, but I think a lot of them clearly thought, based upon the language of the debates at the time, that this would lead to desegregation in some states. This would prevent things like separate but equal from going through. And so by using originalist methods, you can go through and say, they meant this, maybe their practices didn't always reveal it, but this is what they meant. And others have looked and said, you know, again, we can look at this, so I'll say sense reference again, right? We look at the equal protection of the laws, the Constitution guarantees us the equal protection of the laws. At the time, that meant something, right? And at the time, when it, it meant this kind of a quality of personhood, but it referred to the time to thought, you know, we can separate people on the basis of their skin color, and they're still treated equally. And over time, we get to a point where we look back and say, you know, the facts change. <laughs> Right, maybe we thought something then that clearly is not the case today. And when we look at equality, when it refers to today, separation is clearly unequal. And so the reference point has changed in our discussion. So words might have still had that fixed meaning. We can spend some time thinking about that, but it has changed over time. So there are ways that, uh, or finally, and Judge Bork is one of those who said, like, look, it says equal. Equal means equal. You, you can't pack in separate, right? Separation inherently means inequality. So that, that just doesn't work. It was never right. No matter what people thought at the time, this is one of the cases where we can't even just look at the plain text and look at us there. Yeah, but it's a challenge, right? It takes, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of ways about thinking about the Constitution in other ways. And then people talk about things like, like a, I mean, we'll, we'll just take abortion, right? Say the, the Constitution doesn't protect abortion. Right? It, it would have nothing to say about abortion. And for the originalists, they would say, um, I suppose that's true. Um, but we don't think the Constitution does everything. Right? The Constitution does a little bit. And it doesn't do an unlimited amount of the stuff that we might like or dislike. And so while I think a lot of conservatives tend to be originalists, there are many people who would support abortion rights and yet are still originalists and say, Constitution just doesn't say anything about it. It goes to the states. California might permit uh, abortion, and South Dakota might outlaw it, and that's federalism. <laughs> and until we get to a consensus where we amend the Constitution to protect it or outlaw it, it has nothing to say about it. And that leaves a lot of people frustrated, right? Particularly, I think, progressives who say, there's a right to privacy, we should embrace privacy rights, that includes things like rights to contraception and abortion, and uh, a lot of different kinds of liberties that might not be embodied in the past of the Constitution. Those are good things, and those are things that we want to achieve. And for the originalists, they'd say, maybe they're good things, or maybe they're not. Uh, but they're left with the political process. And judges shouldn't be in the business of sort of digging in and figuring out what the text of the Constitution has to say. Again, leads to troubling results at times. But that's what the political process, they would say, is for. We need that super majoritarian commitment before we can really, really make a change but I know, so, I know yeah. uh, some higher courts, the Supreme Court, can decide to hear whatever case yeah. the lower it wants to. Yeah. But you give them the impression that judges are looking for opportunities to do what they want. The only way they can act is when somebody sues somebody <coughs> for having been wrong. Yes. And so it's not their choice that that comes before them. That's right. And, and I don't know, I, I think just some of the ways it's been worded, um, uh, not as clear as you are in other areas. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, so you're right, the courts just don't make it up, right? They wait for the cases that come to them, and then they decide whether or not to take them. Um, and for a long time there were, um, I, so I think contraception cases were a little bit more common than abortion cases. But 
Contraception cases came up before the court in the 40s and 50s, and the court didn't do anything about it. And then it comes up in the 60s, and the court does something about it. So they have, you're right, they have to wait, and sometimes uh, in some of these cases they wait a long time. And, yeah, and, yeah. What, and what would you say, right, by extension, what would you say then that the needs, the immediate needs of the people or society are going faster than Congress ever will, or the courts ever will? Yeah. Well, um, so like right, you know, rights yeah, for yeah. No, I mean, this group what, or that group or yeah. whatever. So I think I think in a lot some of these cases, I, I guess maybe one challenge is uh, some cases they move faster than others. So let's take um, Loving versus Virginia, which is the uh, interracial marriage ban, right? Um, by that point, Virginia is one of four states left. <laughs> I mean, there's not that, or no, I guess I guess they were twelve. I think of poll taxes. With the poll tax case, I was in the fourth state. There's four states left. There's a lot of places where there's a big consensus in the country, and there's just like a few holdout jurisdictions. And so, which way does that cut for the court? To say, all right, let's just kind of sweep up and finish up here, or if you wait a little longer, the political process will work it out, you hope, but it doesn't leave people kind of without a right, without a remedy at this point in time. Right? Um, or there are other places where, and this, this was the case with, uh, with abortion, you know, it was, restricted in some sense in all 50 states. When Roe versus Wade comes down, and at least it can be rolled back in some regard in all 50 states, which is I think, pretty pretty significant change in what, it, 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 I think maybe a reason why it continues to be so divisive today. It was not like a point where the court is just sweeping up like it did with interracial marriage or poll taxes. Uh, it was sort of injecting itself a little bit early in the process. But you're right, they have to wait. <laughs> they have to wait for somebody with a dispute to come up before them before they get and then it is a, sometimes a judgment call on when the courts can step in. Yeah. Absolutely. Other thoughts? Worries? Questions? Brown versus the Board of Education, yeah. though, the unintended results were, were that it led to schools hiring black teachers in order to, well, if the black schools are inferior, then we can only keep the white school open and everybody will go there, but we won't need your services anymore. I think, we yeah, have one challenge is, I mean, and this happens well in any case, right? There are unintended consequences with all these cases. And so one is Brown versus Board, where it starts and says, well, uh, integrate with all deliberate speed. So they come up the next year and they say, what does that mean? It says, well, you gotta get moving faster than you just did the last year. And it might, for a long time, for, you know, for over a decade, they were hearing a lot of these school busing cases and then, it was, well, you have to bus across districts as a remedy, but you have to bus out of the district, outside the district, and um, it's a lot of supervision for the court. So one is to say, well, just let politics, well, politics might not be the best place for it, but politics can sort out questions that maybe courts aren't ready to handle at a particular point in time. At the same time, if they're not answering it, if the legislature's not answering it, you gotta keep going to the courts. You gotta keep asking the courts time and time again. Didn't the original language just request, they didn't say that, that the black school that, that she was attending was inferior, it's just that she had to walk past the white school mm -hmm. to get to the black school. But that the ruling that um, Earl Warren gave actually you know, denigrated the quality but by assuming that the black schools were inferior. Yeah, and I think at least in many cases that was assured the case. Um, I think there, there's, Justice Thomas has come out uh, in some sense in, in defense of historically black colleges and universities to say, look, I'm not, I'm not all the way on board there because I think these institutions do lots, did and do lots of great things despite the separation, um, despite the fact that they created their own institutions. But it's like a different kind of <laughs> complicated question. It's, uh, I think there's no question the litigant, right, the, the, the in Brown, they said, I have this problem to defeat the school system. Right? Can you offer me a remedy for it? The court, the court offers a remedy, right? You have the right to be able to attend this white school. Um, so that opens the door to a long period of time of what courts are going to do, how they're going to apply it, what that's going to look like. And so many would say, better the political process. And others say, look, the process is not working here. <laughs> you just need the courts to be involved, however imperfectly they might be. All right, what else? That 315 point of the day. We need another bite of donut. Put yeah. original, put original 
to say, you know, this is about process and watch out. Originally it said, or would they argue, this is taking us as a nation to a place where we don't want to be? Yeah. Um, or is it, or is both it, it depends. Process? <laughs> yeah. So I think at, at the beginning, so I, I open with, there are some of those who say, like, I think it, I think originalism leads to better results than the war in court, right? Which I just pick as the, because they tend to be the one that people pick on, right? I think originalism leads us to a better place than the war in court did, and they eventually care about it. And others would say, look, whether I like it or not, I think the writtenness of the Constitution, I think what the founders intended, I think what, whatever your theory is, popular sovereignty demands that we stick to the text. And maybe I don't like the results, but I gotta stick to the text because that's how I'm faithful to the people. That's how I'm faithful to the original founding generation. And we need to have like, robust discussions about state laws, about Congress passing new laws, about amending the text of the Constitution. And so th there would be those process-based kinds of folks too. Great. Anything else? I, I had a, a, an interesting conversation with a father who insisted that all three branches of government make laws. And I said no. And he gave me his reasoning, and I, I went, well, you're still wrong. <laughs> um, he, was, he was trying to explain that the judicial court, um, by telling people, no, you can't have that deal, it's unconstitutional, is in a back door way making a law. Yeah. So and then he, he was also claiming that the president, through his executive orders, enacts laws, but they're like paper cups. They're not, <laughs> the, they're not solid. And, and I, I, so it, it, what terrified me was he was actually dragging me into his line of thought. <laughs> oh, boy. It's like another five-hour discussion about what law is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think there's no, I think there's no question that if you're talking about like the kinds of rules that guide us, obviously, this, part of it is how robust do you say it? if the Supreme Court is construing the text of the Constitution, is that making a law, right? So I think to, to in the 80s, I keep coming back to the 80s, it was probably to refer to like judicial activism, right? And right. activism were judges instituting their policy preferences to make law, which is by striking down acts of Congress under their own personal policy preferences. There are lots of different ways to define activism. I don't think it's a great term to use, but that would be one way of doing it. So that's, I think, a very popular way to think about it. Um, so me, I, I'm, I'm less of a realist, right? I, I feel much more of a formalist. I, think, I, I don't think very often the court is just in there to kind of tear up the Constitution and make its laws. I think a lot of times it is doing what it thinks is the proper interpretation and construction of the law. But that's a real challenge, right? Because I think many people would say, just just exercising power. And they're just exercising their lawmaking power like anybody else might. Um, now, this is not to say, he's not, you, know, you don't want to tell him he's going to be right, right? But the, the, the federal courts occasionally do make common law. They do make laws. But it's in things like uh, when they, if Iowa and Illinois had a dispute over a little plot of land in the Mississippi River, who has title to it? Supreme Court's got to make up rules because, because you can't use Illinois law and you can't use Iowa law to figure out who else. So there are like these little enclaves I talk about in federal court. And as for the executive, um, you know, the executive is empowered by Congress at times to promulgate regulations that bind with the force of law. I mean, the entire point of the Environmental Production Agency, let's say, is to go out there and create rules and regulations. Congress is the ultimate one that says, protect endangered species, keep the air clean, keep the water clean. But it is left to the agency to fill that out. And so this is another challenge. Is this just, is this making law? Uh, it's a little different than executive orders. Or is this just fulfilling and executing the congressional mandate, which is Congress says clean the air, okay, now it's my job to go out and do that. Just in the same way that they say, arrest people in possession of marijuana, I gotta come up with a plan to do it, right? So there are different ways the executive yeah, it was just his, his son wanted to argue with me <laughs> about the basic yeah, descriptions yeah. of the branches of government. And uh, I told him to go talk to his father, and his dad was a big mistake. Does the court make law in Rome? 
Rome? I mean, they kind of made well, so, this, I, so I think the, the court in Rome is drawing from the, the text of the Constitution and says um, you can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. And the court's view in Roe, so again, I mean, I'll try, I'll try not to be the, the realist, right? The court's view in Roe is you are deprived of your liberty without due process when, the court, when, a, when a legislature says you cannot get an abortion. They've deprived you of something in your liberty. And before they do that, they need a really good reason, and they haven't done so. Now, in Roe, they say, you know what, once you're 26 weeks along, they got a good reason. Uh, between 13 and 26 weeks, they got to have, you know, a decent reason, but before 13 weeks, there's almost no good reason to stay come up with. So that's, I think, that's the legal hook, right? And for the originalists, they say, no, the, 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 the liberty interest is not a liberty to sort of do whatever the court thinks is right now. They, right, they would say, can't be deprived of liberty without due process of law. The due process is you go to the legislature, you go to the executive, they pass a law, they enforce it. That's process. And you can be deprived of, you can be arrested if, right? You can be deprived of your liberty at any point in time if they go through the legislature and the executive. So the, the, the people who attack Roe as being an activist or making law decisions, they're just making it up. Um, I, you know, I don't think they're making it up. I think they're really trying to take, stick it to the text. They're just using a very different method of interpretation, which is we think there's sort of a consensus of values. We think we need to provide protection for the liberty interests that women have. We're worried that legislatures are not giving enough care and protection in that regard. And that's just kind of a judgment call about what's happening around us and construing the text. Because due process is not an easy, obvious thing to understand, right? What process is do you? The court is construing it in a way that they think makes the most sense to them. All right, well, hopefully it's been illuminating. Again, not, I'm sure I didn't change anybody's mind on anything, particularly so I was trying to provide all aspects, but hopefully it gives you something useful to think about when, when people use that word originalism, that there's lots of ways it can be used, uh, can be applied, hopefully provides some value, some context, and uh, if you can see, I don't know how often your students are going to ask about it. At least, it's, uh, at least you got something in the background there to think about. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure.